church family. Um, I chose this this sim for sentimental reasons. It's it was my dad's favorite. He passed away about a year and a half ago, but I know that he was under our heavenly Father's wings, and I will see him again someday. So. If you could join us in singing this hymn today, no matter what's going on in the world around us, we have the assurance that um, we are always welcome under the Father's wings. Thank you to the Patton family for opening song. Bogdan has our opening announcements and our welcome. Good morning, church family. It is uh, good to get together every Sabbath. And I'm so grateful that we migrated from the recorded to the Zoom. Even though we don't share the same uh, video quality, it is so good to see each other's faces and have the 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 feeling that we are live and together and having fellowship. 
So everybody is welcome. And today is our, our first uh, worship for the month of March. I had a thought that I want to share with you from the Bible in 1 John 1, verses 3 and 4. And he says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. And I consider that it is actually a great joy just to be together. And with this thought, I, I want to share the announcement, which are not many this uh, for this time, but certainly are, are very meaningful. And the first one, you know, every week we say that uh, we, we, we want to help and we as a church, we have a helping hand and we are so willing to do that. But today I would like to share that because of this, in the past two weeks, we have met at least three new people that have approached the church asking for help and now are being connecting probably to even start some Bible studies. So it is amazing how just the willingness of helping opens new doors. But this message will not go too far if we don't share it more uh, consistently as individuals. So I, I would like to invite you today that you keep in mind that whatever you know about someone, not only for yourselves, but anyone that may be within your reach, that you could consider that the hope the church could help, please share this message, share the, the church phone number, and maybe we can connect with them and be of a great blessing. The other thing that I, I, uh, I wanted to tell you is that uh, our Bible forum is uh, meeting now for, for the last meeting for the Book of Philippians uh, this coming Tuesday. And since I'm talking so much about fellowship and, and the greatness of it, the pastor and I have been working in to promote more uh, fellowship spaces for us besides the Sabbath. And this is a great, great area of fellowship that we are having on Wednesdays. Uh, after this coming Tuesday, when we finish the book of Philippians, Pastor Ford is bringing to us a whole new series of studies with uh, a lot of uh, multimedia information and it seems to be very engaging and very enriching. So I just want to invite you honestly to, to join us on Wednesday uh, evenings and participate and take advantage of this uh, window of opportunity to have more fellowship together. And at the same time, uh, remember to share it with other people because this is going to be a lot of uh, uh, knowledge that may be profitable for anyone who will come. We would especially would like to have new visitors and use this as a tool for outreach. Um, for the tithes and offerings, well, we're still uh, on a website is still always functioning and it's functioning properly. So, you know, you go to online giving, you click there and there is direction that will guide you to, to do so. Uh, also a reminder that share our website with, with, with your acquaintances. And uh, you can also send an envelope, as usually, to our address, 375 Lighthouse Avenue, Pacific Grove. And finally, the other window for fellowship, which has been a very special blessing. I've lost the count now, but we must be close to a year, if not already a year, that we've been praying every, mon every um, Monday and every Thursday. And I can tell you that there have been so many blessings. We're keeping a record of prayers and answered prayers. And it is, it is a little sad that not so many people are participating when we nourish so much from each other, not only by praying, but also by sharing the praises that the things that God has done in our lives. So uh, I just cannot stop inviting you. Join us for prayer meeting and uh, just abide with us for, for half an hour. Let us pray together. Let us grow stronger in faith and stronger in the Lord. Thank you so much again for joining us.
And uh, this is our announcements for today. Now, I would like to invite each one of us to humbly um, bow your heads or kneel down if it's possible and let us have a, a prayer time. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, today we're together to remember as you commanded us in your law, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Lord, and to remember about you as our creator, as a Lord, as the master of our lives. And this is our humble worship service to you, Lord, to honor your name and glorify your name. So we ask the blessing of your Holy Spirit to be upon us, each home, each individual, each person that represents here a family group or a community, Lord, that they may feel the special blessing that you have prepared for the Sabbath day. Father, I also pray for all the people who are in different needs that have not expressed it yet or are already expressing them now and seeking for help, Lord, that you may provide for each one of them and that your promises may be fulfilled in the lives of each individual by the many prayers and praises that we bring before your throne, Lord. I also want to pray for Pastor Ford, that you anoint him with your spirit, Lord, as he brings us your word today. And may we all feast on the, on the bread of life, which is your word, Lord. Finally, Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for the soon relief of this pandemic and the opportunity, Lord, by your blessing and power to open our doors and once again fellowship in, the, in person and be with doors open receiving our visitors, our community. Lord, this is our prayer today. We surrender to you with all our hearts and our lives in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bogdan. Bogdan also has our children's story this morning. Ooh. Good morning, children. It, it's so cold out there. I'm sorry it took me a few minutes, but there was a lot of snow out there. You see, I live here in, in, the, in the Himalayas. You know what the Himalayas are? It's the highest and coldest and snowiest mountain on the whole world. And this is where I live with my family. And me and my son, we, oof, me and my son, we are tourist guides. So whenever the tourists come to visit with us, my son takes him to one place, I take him to another place. But he's just a little boy. You wouldn't believe he's just 10 years old. He's like this, but he's so smart and he knows all the roads and he knows all the ways. And he will take the tourists in a big group to special places. So the story I want to tell with you, share with you today, happened with my son last week. He was leading this group of tourists. And one of the ladies who was a scientist, she asked about the special flower, the special tiny little flower called Edelweiss that grows here in the Himalayas and on the Alps. And she wanted to see a specimen for that flower. It's very rare to find it, but my son knew that uh, near the edge of one of the cliffs, there is a flower there. So he took them there and she asked him, would you please try to get that flower for me? I would love to have that specimen for my science class. And my son, he's a skillful climber he said, okay, I will do that for you, lady. So he starts climbing down the cliff and suddenly one of the rocks was loose and he slipped and he started falling down and he just barely grabbed a little rock and he was hanging down the cliff and everybody was so scared and screaming and didn't know what to do because nobody was capable enough to go down the cliff and, and, and help him. But somebody had a rope, one of the, the, the other guys, they had a rope. So they quickly grabbed the rope and they throw it down the cliff next to my son. 
And they tell him, hey, grab the rope, grab the rope, we'll pull you out. And he wouldn't. He was just hanging there and hanging there. And, and then some other of the guys came and said, come on, grab the rope. We're going to take you. And the people shouting, grab the rope, grab the rope. And she wouldn't take the rope. He was just, he was just hanging there. Nobody knew. Finally, I heard the whole screaming. They ran to get me and say, what's going on? I said, your son fell down the cliff. I said, what's going on? And then when I go there and they see him there, I grab the rope. I wrap it on my arm and I say, son, grab the rope. Immediately, he grabbed the rope. He put it around his waist and I pulled him back to safety. And we were back together. Thank God for that. So people were so uh, amazed and they asked him, son, why didn't you grab the rope when we throw it to you? You have the, the tourists, you have the guides. Why did you grab it before? He says, because I don't know you people. And I wasn't sure that if I grab the rope, I let go of the rock. If you don't pull me, you will drop me and I will die. But when I saw my dad, I know my dad. And I know that my dad will never let me go. And he will pull me out to safety. That's what I grabbed the rope. So the lesson for us today comes from one Bible verse, which is the book of Isaiah verse 41 13 and it says for I the Lord your God will hold your right hand saying to you fear not I will help you so today children you can know that no matter what happens in your life when it is dangerous when it doesn't feel safe when you're scared you can always stretch up your hand and call the help of the Lord, and the Lord will be there to help you. Okay? So now, let's bow our heads together, and let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because you are our dad, and we know you, and we know that you will always help us and never let go. Thank you for being there, and thank you for allowing us to call you and to get a hold on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for the children's story today. Do we have any children that are able to say thank you by waving at Bogdan today? If you're there, children, wave at him to say thank you. Maybe there's some of the older children that are waving too. Okay, there you go. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, our scripture reading today is going to be brought to us by Gloria Mohano. Gloria? Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is found in James 5, verses 13 to 18. If anyone wants to turn there on their phones, on their, on their Bible, it's James 5, 13 to 18. It reads, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray for him, over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall rise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Amen. Thank you very much for giving our scripture reading today, Gloria. Thank you. Today's message We'll be talking about God's response to apostasy. God's response to apostasy. Apostasy is when people fall away and sometimes get into trouble when they fall away from loving and worshiping God. God's response to apostasy. I want to start by giving an introduction and a background a little bit to what I want to talk about today. Sometimes people find themselves in kind of a mess. 
a situation that they're uncomfortable being in. Sometimes it is of their own making. And other times it's a combination of many things that have happened to them that were completely out of their control. Our story today is like that. But it didn't just happen to one individual, but to a large group of people. You might even say that the majority were headed in the wrong direction, even though each individual has a choice about what they would do and how they would act. The truth is that the leaders of the people led the people down the wrong pathway. Maybe not intentionally at first, but those that are placed in a position of authority can influence others around them, not only by their actions, but by their personal example. The Bible has a lot to say about that. It has a story in the Bible about God giving out talents, different number of talents to different individuals, and how each one will someday be called into account for the talents that God gives us. I think there's even a parable that Jesus talks about that somewhere. In last week's message by Pastor Francis, we were reminded that stewardship is lordship. Powerful message. 1 Peter 4.17 comments on this idea about the fact that we're given talents. And it says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. If it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So the concept and the idea in the Bible is that if you're given gifts and talents, you're supposed to use them. If you're given lots of gifts and talents, you're going to be held accountable for those. In Ezekiel 9, if you read verses 3 through 6, and I won't read all of that today, it talks about the same concept. It gives a similar thought, and it speaks about people being held accountable. And it uses this phrase when... The angel actually goes out and starts holding people accountable. It says, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. In other words, if you take on responsibility and God gives you blessings and gifts and talents, and you're leading out in something, God expects a lot more of you. Our story today, that kind of gives us the background for our story today. Our story today starts in the days of King Solomon who was a powerful ruler. He was blessed by God with great wisdom. We talk about how wise Solomon was. In 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 and 30, it says these words about Solomon's wisdom and how smart he was. 1 Kings 4, verse 29 and 30. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. Although Solomon was very wise in many ways, he kind of stumbled in other ways. You know, we talk about his wisdom, and this verse even says he was, had more wisdom than all the men of the east and the wisdom of Egypt. For a long time, scholars have tried to figure out how they built the pyramids and they got the rocks so close together that you can't even slide a piece of paper in between the rocks of the pyramids. I mean, they're supposed to be cut at a quarry a long ways away, and then they transport them, and then they build them and put them together, and they fit so nice and neat and clean. They didn't have a belt sander or anything like that, but they got them to work and fit, and wow, how did they do it? Well, they were pretty smart people. Apparently, they had wisdom, but the Bible says Solomon had greater wisdom than all the wisdom of Egypt. But although Solomon was very wise in many ways, he stumbled in other ways. In his day, it was the uh, custom or tradition where the king would often take wives of other nations in order to cement alliances between countries. And although Solomon loved and worshiped the one and only true God, he kind of faltered in this area. And it led not only to the downfall of his kingdom, but to the rapid decline of his own household immediately following his death. The united tribes of Israel deteriorated quickly unto two kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And then 
over 80 years, one leader after another led the people astray until most of the people had abandoned their faith in God. And they were actually worshiping a different God called Baal. And then the Bible says that about after 80 years, Ahab came to rule and he ruled for 22 years. The Bible says Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30 and 31, it says, Now Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Our scripture reading for today is in James chapter 5. Gloria did a great job in reading that. But it says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three years and six months. He prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. What can we tell from our scripture reading today with this background and this setting in mind? Well, first of all, three things. If we were to summarize it quickly, we would say that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Well, that's true what it says. We'll have to think about that one a little bit and look at it. And then secondly, things happened when he prayed. It says he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then thirdly, it says he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Powerful in prayers. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But I want to back up a minute to the first part of what it says in our text today. What can we tell from that text? What does it mean when he says he had a nature like ours? Well, when we think of Elijah as a prophet, when we think of him, I think of him anyway, when I study the Bible about Elijah, he's a prophet that stood up for God up on top of Mount Carmel. And I think of the great showdown that he had up there between good and evil when he faced down 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who ate at Jezebel's table, according to 1 Kings 18.18. 18. What a story. You know, that's a story in itself. And I think most Seventh-day Adventists are familiar with that great showdown where fire comes down and God answers by fire when Elijah prays and he builds up the altar of God. Well, there's a lot of details in that story we could go over. We're mostly familiar with it. That's in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, that whole story, if you want to read it this afternoon sometime after church. But according to verse 27 and 29, Elijah let the other prophets, the false prophets, go first. And he says, you have so many, you guys go first. You sacrifice a bull and put it on your altar, but don't put any fire underneath it. And then when they did all that and they were jumping around and doing all kinds of things, trying to get their God Baal to answer by fire, then the Bible says in verse 27 and 29 of first Kings 18, it says he began to mock them. He mocked the false prophets. And he said, cry aloud for maybe your God, uh, he's meditating or maybe he's busy or maybe he's on a journey or maybe he's sleeping and you got to wake him up. I love it. So then it says, they cried louder and they cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. And then it says there was no voice. Maybe their voices, they lost their voice because they were jumping around and hooting and hollering too much. But it says there was no voice. And no one answered them. There was no God that answered by fire. And no one answered. And then the last part of that verse says, and no one paid attention. <laughs> I love what it says there. No one paid attention. The people got tired of this jumping around and hooting and hollering, but it didn't lead to something that could help them. They were in a drought. It hadn't rained for three and a half years. And they were hooting and hollering all day long and cutting themselves and trying to get fire on their altar. But Elijah was watching them. And then no one paid attention. Some might say by those statements about what Elijah did, that he was bold and outspoken. And they might say, well, pastor, that's not me. Our text today says 
Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Why would it say that? Are there times when Elijah was afraid or could have been afraid? Not Elijah. We don't think of him that way. But according to the Bible, Elijah faced disappointment. He faced obstacles in his pathway. He faced depression and loneliness. A lot of different things that normal people face, those kind of things. Think about it for a moment. On Mount Carmel, he faced many different groups that were there and present that day when they met up on the top of that mountain. There were 450 prophets of Baal. That's quite a few more than just Elijah. And then there was 400 prophets that sat at Jezebel's table that worshiped Astra. And then there was all the people that had gone astray. One of the first things Elijah said to the people that had gone astray and started worshiping Baal, he says, if Baal is God, then worship him. How long are you going to fool around thinking about worshiping two different gods here? Either if God is God, worship him, or Baal is God. And the Bible says the people answered not a word. They had nothing to say when Elijah called them out. So there was all the people there that had gone astray. And then there was the wicked King Ahab and all his officers and his soldiers that were there. Remember that the king had been searching for Elijah for three and a half years, according to what Obadiah says. And he was asking every nation, have you seen this guy? Have you seen this guy? And he was trying to kill Elijah. So Elijah had all those people and he was willing to face them all. And you say, well, that makes him bold. Well, you know, that was a lot to face down. But right after he was victorious on Mount Carmel and Ahab went back to his kingdom and he talked to wicked queen Jezebel, Jezebel threatened to take Elijah's life. And then Elijah was so afraid, the Bible says, he ran away to hide. He was so discouraged. He said he actually wanted to die. You can read about that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. Now, that seems like somebody different than what we're used to hearing about and somebody different than what we're used to thinking about when we think of Elijah. But I'm going to read those verses for a minute in 1 Kings chapter 19. I want to read that with you for a minute. 1 Kings 19 verses 1 to 4. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also, how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Now, if you travel to Mount Carmel today and you go up on top of that mountain, there's still an altar up there. And that altar is actually a statue of Elijah. I could show you a picture of it. I should have brought that with you. I could share my screen and show it to you, but I didn't put it in my message this morning. But there's a picture with Elijah has his sword drawn and he's got his foot on the head of one of the false prophets and he's about to chop the guy's head off. That statue is still up there on Mount Carmel. So it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done on how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree and prayed that he might die and said, it is enough, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. So Elijah faced discouragement, many challenges, disappointment, depression, even. That's why maybe the Bible says that he faced things like we face. He had a nature like our nature. That's in our scripture reading today. That's a different picture that maybe we don't portray or think about very often. Then in 1 Kings 19 verse 10, Elijah says to God, you know, I am alone. I'm the only one that's left worshiping you. In reality, God told him that there were 7,000 that had remained faithful to God and had not bowed knee to Baal. That's in 1 Kings 19, verse 18. 
these statements show from Elijah that even though he walked with God and was used by God in a very powerful way, there were times in his life that he felt alone. It says he had a nature like ours, subject to stresses that we face from day to day. You know, the second thing that our text tell, talks about is his prayer life. And I want to spend some time on that. It says things happened when Elijah prayed. It says he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. You know, it lists two different times that he prayed, one to stop the rain and one to start it up again. Both times God heard and answered his prayers. That's pretty powerful prayers. You know, I know a lot of times uh, people pray for rain because of this and that, and it uh, doesn't rain. It says God answered his prayers. God's answer to Elijah's prayers was to send Elijah to confront Ahab and announce God's judgment that was coming. There's going to be no more rain. That's powerful prayers. I want to say that again. God's answer, God's response to this apostasy was to, to answer Elijah's prayers but it was to send Elijah to confront Ahab and announce God's judgment. Rain's not going to happen except by my word. God said, go tell him. Who did God send? Who was this guy? Elijah. The Bible says it was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly and it didn't rain. Why would he be doing that? For a number of years, God's people were straying from God. Leader after leader introduced the false worship to the people until they lost their hold on the power that sustained them. God chose Elijah, not the other way around. God often chooses the ones that he knows will respond to his call when the Holy Spirit moves upon them. Maybe it isn't the most eloquent person. Maybe it isn't the most gifted person. But it's the ones that God deems qualified for the job that needs to be done. I want you to think about that for a moment. Because maybe you don't feel strong and powerful like Elijah. But I want you to reflect with me just for a moment about people that God called. Well, he called Moses. And Moses was a murderer. But... What a work he had to do for Moses. He called Saul of Tarsus, the guy that was actually persecuting the church. And what a work he had to do for the Apostle Paul. That's who Saul became, the Apostle Paul. And then he called John the Baptist. This was a guy that lived out in the wilderness. How does it say Elijah was dressed and, you know, in the last part of our scripture reading, I want to talk about what's important. And Carl brought up this point in our adult Sabbath school class today, that God doesn't look on the outside, and that's not what Jesus had. He, he masked, and our Sabbath school lesson from Isaiah was about that today. God masked his outward appearance from his glory shining and showing and overwhelming people so that the beauty of his life might be revealed. It was what was inside. I think Tim was quoting about that from uh, 1 Samuel uh, 16 or 17, where it talks about God doesn't look on the outside, but he looks on the inside, on the heart. In the last part of our scripture reading today, it says, Elijah prayed and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. He got answers to his prayers he actually attained the status of what we've been promised in the future from god each one of us has that promise from god what does it say in isaiah 65 24 it shall come to pass that before they call i will answer while they're still speaking i will hear what does this tell us about elijah's prayer life Elijah received what he prayed for, even though he was a man with a nature like ours. How did he do that? 
What was one of the secrets of Elijah's life so he could have this power in his life? Well, over and over, it talks about one of those secrets in Elijah's life, and it, I think it dealt with his connection to God. In 1 Kings 17, 1, when Elijah first steps up to wicked King Ahab, and God sent him there. It doesn't give his credentials as a long list of a pedigree. I went to the certain school or this one or that one. But he says to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. You see, Elijah lived in the very presence of God. He figured out that God was always with him. God was with him even when maybe nobody else was. Now, we've been separated from each other for a long time. We've been meeting on Zoom, and we haven't been able to get together and give each other a hug and experience the fellowship. But Elijah talked about carrying that fellowship with him all the time. As he says to Ahab in 1 Kings 17, 1, as the Lord God of Israel lives, he knew that God was alive and well in his life. And then he says, before whom I stand, he understood that God was with him even when no one else was, when he was lonely and afraid. In 1 Kings 18, verse 16, when Elijah, after three and a half years of drought in Elijah, shows himself and God says you go show yourself to Obadiah and reveal yourself to Ahab and he walks along the pathway and runs into Obadiah the guy that's the overseer for wicked king Ahab's household when appearing to Obadiah Elijah says these words in 1 Kings 18 verse 16 as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand I will surely present myself to Ahab today so Elijah not only knew that God was alive and well, but then he says, as the Lord of hosts lives, he not only knew that God was the leader of the armies of Israel, but he had all of God's resources at his disposal because he could talk to God personally. And then he says, before whom I stand, he had that assurance of God's presence, no matter what he faced, the challenges, the hardships, the hard times, the lack of resources, the separation from others, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. I love the way he says that. And then you go a step further, if you really think about his prayer life and his connection to God. In 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, when Elijah's successor, you remember that he threw his cloak over a young man that was going to be his successor and take over after he was gone. What was that guy's name? That was Elisha, not Elijah. And the Bible says that Elisha poured water on Elijah's hands. He was his helper for a while. And then he, Elijah, put the mantle on his shoulders and he took over. Second Kings 3, verses 13 to 15. It says, when Elisha was speaking to the king of Israel, notice the words he used. He says, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. I wonder where Elisha picked up that phrase from. <laughs> I love it. What an influence Elijah had. A big part of Elijah's success is that he learned to visualize himself in the presence of God. Visualization of your goals is a technique that's taught by all professional coaches. They teach them to Olympians and to athletes like Tiger Woods. He talks about that in some of his videos. You know, you have to visualize. I'm always amazed when I see some golfer walking around and he takes this little tiny golf ball. I've tried this because I play golf and I'm lousy at it but I've hit a few balls around. It takes me a million hits in order to get to the hole. If it's supposed to get there in seven or four strokes or something, I might get there in 27, but I'm working at it, having fun. Anyway, 
um, I'm amazed when I see these golfers walking around and they're holding this golf club in one hand and they put a golf ball on the end of the golf club and they're bouncing it up and down and they're looking at the camera and they're talking to somebody else and they're doing this. They're taught to visualize when they hit that ball right where it's going to go. It's going to land on the green. It's going to roll right up to the pin so that it's about a foot away. I've watched the highlights from Tiger Woods' life and his golf career, and I've seen him where he's down in the sand trap over and he hits the ball way up on a hill and it hits the top of the hill and it spins around a little bit and it drops over and rolls down and drops in the hole. You see, visualization, visualization is an important technique that all professional coaches teach to athletes and to Olympians. Jack Canfield talks about that also in his book, Success Principles, when he talks about people being successful and reaching their goals. And he talks about it in the terms of money and the possessions that a person wants. You know, if you want a big house that you park your helicopter next to, then get a picture of a house that has a helicopter parked next to it and a big house. And every night when you go to sleep, you look over at your goal and you visualize it. Well, I wonder, can you visualize how much God loves you? Do we do that with our spiritual goals? Can you visualize how much the Lord of hosts and all his armies and resources are there for you to encourage you, to strengthen you, to provide for you? Can you hear him saying to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Can you feel his arms wrapped around you? Do you have spiritual goals? Do you visualize them? Apparently, Elijah was a man, according to our scripture reading, with a nature like ours. But he was also someone who learned how to not only pray earnestly, but to visualize the reality of his walk with God. Amen? Doesn't God's word tell us that God loved him so much, he even sent a fiery chariot to pick him up and bring him home. What is the context of our scripture reading today that's found in James chapter 5, verse 13 to 18? What's the context of these statements? The context of that scenario as it talks about this powerful prophet of God that has a nature like ours. The context is that it, it's in the midst, it's talking about anointing other people around us for healing and then seeing the miraculous results. You know, those results happened not because Elijah was a great prophet of God, but according to the text, those results came about through the power of fervent prayer. Let's look at the statement again in its context. In James chapter 5, verse 13 to 18, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. You see, the power wasn't in Elijah's hands. It was in God's hands. And Elijah figured out how to get that power out of God's hands and work through him to touch the lives of others because he prayed that there wouldn't be any more rain so that the people's lives would be affected, and they would turn back to the living God. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then we get into the part we've been emphasizing and talking about in our scripture reading. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly 
that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Powerful, powerful stuff. There's a lot of different places that you can get anointing oil. When I was over in the Holy Land in Israel, I'm going to show this to you. I picked up this little bottle of oil over there and they sell it and you can buy it. Sometimes it says frankincense and myrrh or it says anointing oil on it and it's got a special fragrant in it. You can buy it in different shops that sell things like that. But you know, it's not the oil that's special. It's the fact that you're trusting in God by faith. Because it talks about that in our scripture reading. It talks about us acting in faith. Actually, the vial of oil that I carry isn't this one that I showed you that's so pretty and nice and looks so nice. The vial of oil that I carry, this is what it looks like. It's a tiny little vial, and I want you to see it. You know where I got it from? I walked into one of the... Uh, department stores, J.C. Penney or Macy's or one of those stores, and I walked up to the perfume counter, and I said, hey, do you happen to have one of your little sample perfume vials that I could have, and they give them out free? Now, I took it home, and I dumped the perfume out of it and kind of washed it out. It smelled pretty, and it was nice, but that isn't what I wanted. I wanted the little vial, and you can buy these silly things, little vials like this in metal for nitroglycerin tablets or something that people have to take for their heart sometimes, little tiny vial. I dumped it out, and I put olive oil in it. And you know, when people need prayer and you want to be encouraged, many people, I tell them, I anoint people freely, and sometimes people come to me with their relatives that are sick or something. And I've told stories about that. We've even had that happen in our church where people have come for anointing. We've anointed them and they've been healed of uh, big diseases. And most of you know about that from the past. And I've even had church members come to me about their children. I had a lady that was a senior about 70 or 80 years old. And she said, oh, pray for my son, Frank. Well, I said, well, have him come to church and we'll anoint him. Well, he showed up when church was over. He was waiting for us and we anointed him and he had a special medical problem. And I asked her three weeks later if, if he was okay. And she said, oh yeah, he was healed. Well, I never heard from him. I didn't know. I want to encourage you to exercise your faith. If that means buying a little bottle of anointing oil and carrying it with you, then so be it. That may not follow all the strict guidelines of everything it says in the text about calling for the elders of the church to do an anointing service, an official service of gathering you together. But it may help you remember that God has called you to touch the lives of others around you and influence them so they might experience God for themselves. And what can happen when we walk and worship the living God? I can remember when the church administration first placed me in my own church and I was leading out in its services. I was the pastor there. I was an unordained pastor. So I did all the things that I thought the pastor was supposed to do. And then one day I got a call from the conference office and they were asking me if I wanted them to come up and ordain my elders because I was unordained as a pastor. I hadn't been ordained or set aside for the ministry yet. Well, I didn't know that as an unordained pastor, I wasn't supposed to be ordaining my local elders. I was supposed to wait for someone from the conference office that was ordained to come up and do that for me. Well, I had already ordained all my elders and we were moving forward. I told them since I didn't know I was supposed to wait, I'd already ordained everybody and we were moving forward. I guess I wasn't supposed to do that. I want you to, I want to help you visualize God's love for you. I want you to encourage, be encouraged that if the altar in your life, your family altar of worship has kind of been neglected in your home and it's kind of fallen into ruins, 
where you gather together each morning and evening around that altar, just like in Elijah's day, the altar of God had kind of been deteriorating and had fallen down. If that's happened in your life, I want to help you reestablish that altar in your life and that connection with God. I want you to remember that God doesn't always pick the most upright people or the most eloquent people to do his work when it describes Elijah. It describes him as a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist, but people knew it was Elijah the Tishbite. God was able to use Elijah in a powerful way to help others. God not only used Elijah to touch others, but miraculous things seemed to swirl around him. Ravens were commanded by God to feed him by the brook Cherith, if you remember the story. God personally guided him as to where to be at certain times in his life. You remember God told him, he says, I have commanded a widow, a widow of Zarephath to feed you. And her bowl of flour did not run dry. And the cruise of oil didn't run dry. It lasted throughout the famine in the land. Others were blessed because of Elijah's ministry and his walk with God. I want God to provide for you in that way in your life. In order to be qualified, all you have to do is be willing to pray and care about other people, to exercise your faith so that God can pour out his spirit and his blessings upon you and work through you to help others. I want to help you visualize God in your life and in his word. So, I'm going to send out a survey this next week. Probably today I'll be sending it out. I'm going to email it to each of you. And I want you to respond. And I'm going to share my screen now so I can remind you about what's coming. Let's see here. I'll make sure I can get that shared. There we go. I want to share that screen with you so that you can see it. About this series that we're going to do. And I'm not even sure when we're going to do it. We've talked about doing it on Wednesday night. But, you know, I'm going to have that in the survey. If it's more helpful to you that we have this several times a week. Now, I can't send the DVD out to each of you personally. But we can broadcast it at different times of the day. And the morning, in the evening, on Wednesday, on Sabbath afternoon. I'll send a questionnaire out to you. And you tell me when this would be helpful if, and if you want to participate, I'll send the lessons out. This series of 20 studies with Tony Moore from It Is Written was filmed on location in Israel, Jordan, Syria, Turkey, Greece, and Italy. It comes with a DVD, and we bought a license from Tony that allows us to show it to you over Zoom. And we'll make that available to you. We want to figure out all the details. We can actually see the Bible come to life, and he's going to take us to the locations where Paul went to to raise up churches. And I want you to participate. There's actually 20 studies in this series with videos to watch from the actual biblical locations. There's lessons where you can fill in the blanks, questions to help you make personal applications to your life. Here's a sample of the first lesson where the church emerges. Here's some of the copies of the lessons so you can see them. Now, according to Tony, we can't record when we put his um, stuff on the screen kind of thing, his DVD presentations. And they have other presentations tracing the footsteps of Jesus. But we as a church want to encourage you to walk with Jesus. They have the world of patriarchs, uh, seven different DVDs where it talks about the Old Testament, all those kinds of things. And if this is helpful to you, you know, I know we have to visualize just like this screen. We have to visualize the church and being together. And I've tried to help do that by putting the church right here behind me and the beautiful tiles that we have in the front of the church. I mean, we have to visualize that until we can meet again together in our church building. But I want to help you visualize many things. And this is one of them, that Jesus is coming again. 
and he's coming again for each one of us. He's coming to take us home. And so I want you to be able to have a closer walk with Jesus. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and just let you know that that's our goal, to help you draw closer to Jesus. And so as we think about the gifts he has for you, and as we think about the this worship program that we want to start, we may run it every Wednesday night. We may have to run our program that Bogdan's been running for a few more weeks until we get completely set up and go into a different book. But we want to make it run smoothly. If you want to participate, when I send out that survey, please respond and say, yes, pastor, I want to participate. I want to watch, but these are the times that might be convenient for me. And we're going to try and make this work in our church so you can benefit from walking with Jesus and going to these biblical places and applying it to your life. So as we bring our message to a close today, I want to encourage you to strengthen your prayer life and your walk with Jesus. As we close our service today, the Patton family is gonna share with us the closing song. I sing the mighty power of God. I think it's number 88. Thank you, church family. Please uh, join us in singing number 88. I sing the mighty power of God. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of you that have helped in this time that we have together to make this work. Bogdan works behind the scenes, McKelly with all the ones that work. And I know we can't be together, but we can share together this time where we fellowship and worship the living God. Let's bow our heads together as we pray to close our service. Father, we are thankful for your great love for us. We thank you for the example of Elijah and his connection with you. We ask, Lord, that 
we might have that same connection with you in our prayer life. And as we walk with you, we know that you're there to provide for us, take care of us, lead us, give us the guidance that we need during these times of stress. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.